as much as I love this notion of a Monday night doubleheader, I mentioned this last week, there's so much that goes on on any given Sunday. So many good things on a Sunday. So many good things on a Sunday that you can't get it all in. You can't take it all in, so why not double up on a Monday? So I like the idea, except in theory. In theory, it's great. I can't say, though, in practice, in practicality, the last two weeks on MNF have been all that awesome or really even remotely exciting. I don't know why the games have to run at the same time, except last night it worked out. Last night, that was a good thing because if we had to watch those two games back to back, that would have made for a long, long night. That would have made for an eternity. It was actually a good thing that they staggered them and had them at the same time. Like, I'll give Joe Burrow and the Bengals this much. They did what they needed to do. It wasn't pretty. In fact, to get right down to it, in a lot of cases, it was pretty hideous. But they were under more pressure than any other team last night. And they went out and they got it done. They accomplished their mission. Mission being, avoid 0-3. Mission being, avoid 0-3 with a hobbled Joey B. Ideally, avoid 0-3 without Burrow further bleeping up that already bleeped up calf. And Cincinnati did succeed in doing so. They made it out of that game 1-2 and and no significant Burrow setbacks. I can hear the sighs of relief coming from the the Natty all the way out here in Orange County. All that said, Joey Burr is kind of a rough watch right about now. Now, all the credit in the world for putting himself out there. He knew they couldn't go to 0-3. He's not himself. He's not 100%. Joe Cool, though, right now is more like Joe Cold because of that. He simply does not look like himself or anything close to himself. And the Bengals' offense does not look like itself. But that did not stop him from slinging it 49 times last night. Ugly as it was for most of that game, you got to give this guy credit for grinding it out, for staying in the fight, for gutting it out. Was it worth it? Was the risk worth it to Cincinnati? Well, obviously, yes, because they won. And dropping to 0-3 with a busted-up quarterback would have been a total disaster. So I would say yes, it certainly was worth the risk. And even Joe himself would agree. Thing is, you never, ever want to play games with the health of a dude that you just signed to a $275 million contract. Especially that team throwing around that kind of money. But that $275 million quarterback was never going to be cool with holding a clipboard and watching his team fall to 0-3. So yes, it was a big risk, but it paid off. And Cincinnati eventually put together enough plays to pull away. The question is, is this the way it's going to be all year long? Is this where it's going to be week to week? Is that injury going to be chronic? Is that going to linger? Is it always going to be like that? Well, if so, it's a good thing they've got the defense that they have. Major assist from my main dude, Lou Anarumo. I'll ask the same question right now that I ask every single year. Why doesn't my dude Lou get more love? Why doesn't my dude Lou have a head coaching job already? He looks like a head coach. He acts like a head coach. He talks like a head coach. He coaches like a head coach. He's a freaking boss. He should be a head coach. Mad scientist named Lou Anarumo. That's it. My man Lou. Except Bengal fans certainly is not complaining that he is still there D.C. It's a good thing. It's a really good thing, especially with Joe banged up. Big lose defense. Sacked Mr. Kelly Blabford six times last night. Held the Rams to one of 11 on third down. That's unbelievable. Snagged a couple of picks. They also just pushed the Rams around in the trenches all night long. Essentially what I'm saying is the Bengals have their defense to thank for that win last night. They have Big Lou to thank for that win last night. And if Joe's not right, and he's not going to be right because of the calf, and this is what's going to happen this year, we're going to need to see a hell of a lot more of that from that defense all season long. They're going to need the defense to pick up that great offense if Joe's not right. That may not be a one-off. 
Cincy's defense looked great. It looked great, but not quite good enough to cover the spread. Do you feel me? Yes, the push king, my man, Sean McVay, was at it again last night. Although at least he didn't kick any unnecessary field goals this time around. So thankfully, we will not have to sit through any more word salad pressers about how he has no idea what the point spread actually was. Whatever you say, all I know is you keep jacking up our uh, people's bets. You and that crazy rookie of yours. It is past time for Puka Nakua to get a shout out on this show. Even if he made the back breaking 37 yard catch to set up that meaningless Rams fourth quarter TD that wrecked the bet. He gets a shout out because that 37 yard catch was his 30th reception of the season already. And no rookie has caught 30 balls in his first three games in the history of the Shield. It's incredible, right? This dude is always open. This dude's always making a one-handed catch, playing dinged up. He just looks like a player. And he could not be off to a better start to his career. And when you consider the Rams are still missing Cooper Cup, it's a pretty damn clutch way to start a career for Puka. So the Bengals looked only I, and the game was not that great, but they did what they had to do. And pretty much the same might be said about the Elgle, Elgles. Anyway, we know the Eagles are all about less thinking equals talent takeover. Less thinking equals talent takeover. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, last night, the talent on that front seven clearly did less thinking because their talent took over the game. The Philly offense, on the other hand, still looks a little wonky, a little funky. Let me put it to you this way. Jalen Hurts and this offense still does not look anything like the version that dominated the league last year. However, Coach Rock Paper Sirianni is not concerned. Let's see how competitive you are. It's a growth. What, like a mole? Like a zit? This dude doesn't sound much more... Thank you, Alvin. This guy's not much better at communicating than James Kelly. I I don't know how it is that he's such a good coach, because he is a good coach. And they obviously respond to him. But he's no more articulate than James Kelly. That sounds like something James Kelly would say during Big Head Bets. They better be in a growth process. Because they're definitely not playing their best ball yet. Not offensively. But I will give them this. Their most dominant play from last year still works. Their most dominant play from last year is still their best offensive play. It might be the most unstoppable play in the NFL right now. In fact, I think that the Tush Push is becoming a candidate to join the other jungle undefeateds. You know, right there with sex, father time diarrhea Diarrhea the The tush push is freaking money however the fake tush push is the opposite of De Niro the tush push is a candidate to join the undefeateds but the fake tush push is one of the ugliest plays I have ever seen true true pretty gross Troy's right Why would you show that play in the fourth quarter of a sleepy 22-3 game in Tampa? The fake push had to be the Eagles' secret weapon, right? you got to save that one, not use it essentially in garbage time. Why would you show anybody that there? Although I guess it was for the best in the end because it was one of the most disgusting plays I've ever seen. I mean, really revolting. Reprehensible. That is a disgusting act. And an insult to the real tush push. You got to love rock, paper, Sirianni. Innovating in this wild age of modern football by essentially lining his team up in a rugby scrum and pushing the quarterback forward. 
Sometimes it is the most simple ideas that are the real genius. Or as Sirianni himself would say, less thinking equals talent takeover. Less thinking equals talent takeover. It's the truth. That that is irrefutable. Less thinking does equal talent takeover. Well said, my man. Extremely well said. Now, the silver lining in all of this, and there is some, the fake tush push was the ugliest scene from Monday night. That's it. That was the worst thing. So that's a major sigh of relief. In other words, we didn't have an iconic quarterback have their season and a franchise-ending injury. We didn't get that. Nobody's body parts got bent in a way so gruesome that the network had to show some human decency and say there will be no replays. We didn't get that. The worst thing that happened was the Eagles took that tush push and made a terrible sequel that nobody asked for. That sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Ah, that's what it reminds me of. I had it in my back of my mind. I couldn't quite get my head around it. Like I knew that reminded me of something. The Eagles took a classic and defiled it in a way that is frankly unforgivable. The only people that didn't hate it were the Bucks. Stop messing with the classics. People saw that fake tush push and they started throwing up all over themselves like my kids did when they went to the theater and they saw Space Jam 2. It's a gross. I'm like, Logan, 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 get to the bathroom. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell to be the first to know when we do upload a new video.